First things first, yes, I know I still have my Christmas decorations up. I'm recording this like the day after Christmas, so give me a break. Second things second, the patrons have spoken and uh, you all voted over in the Patreon poll that I put up on the Film Room Patreon last week and you decided that this week's topic is Micah Parsons. And specifically today, I'm going to talk about not just is Parsons Defensive Rookie of the Year, because of course he is, but is he also Defensive Player of the Year too? A rookie has not won Defensive Player of the Year since all the way back in 1981 when the great Lawrence Taylor did it and he's the only rookie still to this day to ever win that award. And Micah Parsons very well may win it as well and become the second rookie to do it. But should he win it? Has he actually been the best and or most valuable defensive player in the entire NFL this season? And of course, is all of this hype actually warranted? It's a very loaded question, obviously. So I'm gonna break this down into two distinct parts to help make this a little bit more digestible for everyone. Part one will be, what is Micah Parsons actual role in Dan Quinn's defense? And part two will be, why has he been so absurdly productive in that role? relative to pretty much every other rookie linebacker to ever enter the league. Again, there's a lot to go over here. There's a lot of nuance to Micah Parsons' role, so just go grab yourself a drink, uh, get cozy, stick with me for this one because it's a doozy. And of course, before diving into the tape, I do want to take one second to thank our sponsor for today, Hawthorne, for helping to make this show possible. You can go check out that link below if you guys are looking to upgrade your grooming routine for 2022, kind of kickstart the new year right. You can get virtually any product you can think of, specifically tailored to your own interests and unique body chemistry. It's a really cool product, so again, check them out, but more on them later. For now, let's dive into all of this Cowboys tape from this season and talk about the very unique role, or rather roles, that Micah Parsons plays in this Dan Quinn defense. In short, if I had to describe what Micah Parsons actually does in Dan Quinn's system, he's basically the linebacker version of Flex Seal. Whatever Quinn needs him to do to patch a hole or handle a particularly difficult matchup for his defense, he's going to move him around in order to patch that hole or handle that matchup. For instance, if Randy Gregory or Demarcus Lawrence are out with injuries, or in some cases, if both of them are out with injuries, Parsons will predominantly play edge rusher and most of the time be just as productive as Gregory and Lawrence would be in that role. In weeks where Quinn thinks that he needs more speed Mike linebacker to play the run from sideline to sideline and also also run the pole deep down the middle in Tampa 2 looks, he'll play that role as well because he has way more range than every other linebacker on the team, while also bringing absurd levels of physicality between the tackles. Like I'm talking about the ability to generate knockback through a double team as a 240 pound linebacker in order to get a tackle for loss. That's the kind of physicality he has, which in an age of undersized linebackers seems like it's kind of a rarity these days against particularly mobile quarterbacks like, say, Daniel Jones or Taysom Hill, Dan Quinn will also employ him as a spy on third downs in order to track them down in space if they escape the pocket, since obviously he runs 4-3 as well and can pretty much entirely erase their scrambling ability from the game. How about when Dallas is facing teams that like to run a lot of RPOs or zone reads or design quarterback runs on early downs like the Eagles did quite a bit in the first half of the season? Quinn might employ some 5-1 looks there in the double eagle family of fronts. And each coach has different terminologies for these, by the way, whether you want to call it a variation of double eagle or grizz or cheat bear. Again, the exact term doesn't really matter. But what does matter is that Quinn will put Parsons as the weak side edge to the side of the running back in these five man surfaces so that he can be the guy accounting for Hertz as a runner if he pulls the ball and runs away from the flow of the running back. And Parsons' speed as the weak side edge player in those looks was a big reason why Hertz only had 35 yards rushing in their first meeting, which was his third lowest total of the season. Quinn put Parsons in that exact spot just for that week in order to take away that element of Philly's offense. Not only that, but against teams that have weaknesses at either guard position or if they don't have any running backs that can pass protect, Quinn will even attack that on all downs and distances by just relentlessly running fire zones over and over again to force that one-on-one -on -one matchup with those guards or running backs so that Parsons can get a bunch of extra sacks and pressures and tackles for loss in the run game. Whether it's Mike Backer, Will Backer, Sam, Leo, or anything in between, Parsons has played all of those spots on a weak 
week-to-week -week basis, and he's done all of them at a high level. Just imagine if the KJ Wright role, the Bobby Wagner role, the Malcolm Smith role, and the Cliff Averill role from that legendary 2013 Seahawks defense could all reasonably be played by the same guy interchangeably, just based on need and game plan, and that's Micah Parsons. He is, and I do not say this lightly, one of the most unique football players I've ever seen. Because even though he's not perfect at every role yet, he's at minimum above average to good at all of them already, and he's only about 15 games into his career. And believe me, being this good 15 games in is not normal. So in a nutshell, that is the role that Micah Parsons plays in this defense, or rather all of the roles that Micah Parsons plays in this defense. But the question still remains, how is he so productive in all of these spots simultaneously? And is all of that production just a product of the Dan Quinn system? Is he the defensive player of the year because Quinn constantly puts him into great positions to succeed and rack up a ton of numbers? Or is he defensive player of the year because in a season where the Cowboys Boys have been dealing with a lot of injuries, especially along the defensive line, Quinn's defense might not have been as successful in the first place without Parsons putting up all of those insane numbers and making all of those crazy plays. It's kind of a chicken or the egg question, and there's a lot of nuance to the answer, but it is a question worth answering, so let's dive into that. If you put a gun to my head and asked what the secret sauce to Micah Parsons and Dan Quinn's success is, I would say instinct and craftiness. Not just craftiness on Parsons' end, but craftiness on Quinn's end as a play caller as well. When you watch Parsons rush the passer, he has this almost improvisational style that looks like he's constantly just making it up as he goes along, and you think to yourself, there's no way this guy is out here rushing with a real plan. But honestly, he's so versatile and with such a wide array of moves already, even at his young age, that most of the time, his actual plan is reactionary. He's a counterpuncher, so to speak. So he'll just read and react to whatever the tackle is trying to do to him, and then he'll bust out a counter move in order to get the job done. For instance, in the Raiders game, all the way back on Thanksgiving, Parsons had been battling right tackle Brandon Parker all game long and beat him a few different times with a beautiful jab chop rip combo around the edge. That's the combo that you're seeing on screen right now. And by the fourth quarter, he noticed that as a reaction to that, Parker was coming in with a rather wide punch as well as oversetting too deep just a little bit in order to try to choke off his angle to the corner. And Parker was trying to do this in order to catch Parsons chest through that chop move. However, that wide punch to counter the chop left Parker's chest wide open as a result. And Parker's pad level also tends to be a little bit too high when he's really trying to explode back and get depth in the pocket as well, which is a common problem for tackles like him that are six foot eight. So when overtime finally rolled around and Parsons got another crack at Parker in an obvious passing situation, he knew what Parker was probably going to try to do to him, so he relied on that improvisation and versatility in order to punish it. In this rep in overtime, once again Parker was a little bit too high because he's straining himself to get depth in his kick set because Parsons is super fast and he has to get depth, and when he also left his hands low and wide in order to avoid them getting chopped like they had been before, Parsons noticed his vulnerability, literally with his hand in the air in the middle of him going for another chop move, and then he just transitioned that inside arm from a chop into a stab move right into Parker's exposed chest instead. And because Parsons has some seriously explosive power and a massive leverage advantage behind that stab, being just 6'3 against a 6'8 tackle, he was easily able to just run straight through Parker on his way to sacking Derek Carr. If you love that one, just this past week he had an even more impressive rep than that in my opinion, and even though it didn't result in a sack like the one against the Raiders, I do think that it at least showed off how well he can set up counter moves and even counter moves to his counter moves in order to get easy pressures. As anyone who has watched Parsons a lot this year would tell you, he has a deadly spin move that he's employed many times this year as a counter to his speed rush. In fact, I would say that his inside counter spin has been one of his best and most reliable moves when he times it right. But the thing with counter spins is that sometimes tackle Tackles, especially veteran tackles, do know it's coming, and they can time up their punch right to catch it and neutralize it fairly easily. 
For most pass rushers, especially rookie pass rushers, if they get caught mid-spin with their back to the offensive tackle and they suddenly get beat, they don't really know what to do. They kind of just sit there and flounder and say, ah shucks, you got me. But for a guy as crafty as Parsons, getting caught in a spin, at least sometimes, is just a setup move to him. When Washington right tackle Sam Cosme caught that spin last week, or at least thought he caught that spin, Parsons did something that you almost never see, and he spun back again the other way, completely taking Cosme by surprise and getting a wicked hit on Taylor Heineke as he released the ball. It was, for lack of a better word, a counter to a counter move. The only other guy that I've seen hit that fake spin was former Cowboy great Demarcus Ware when he was with the Broncos, and he did that in his 10th year in the league. Parsons busted that thing out like three months into his career. I swear to God, on third downs, the dude's a straight up lunatic who will try pretty much anything to get to the quarterback, and I kind of love him for that. Now, I mentioned also that Dan Quinn himself has great instincts as a play caller and as a designer of defense as well, and he does. In fact, I would say that his willingness to line up Parsons all over the place and call the right pressures at the right time is a big factor in not just Parsons being so productive individually, but in the rest of the defense being productive too. As an example, let's go back to week four in the Panthers game that I promise I will stop mentioning eventually, but it is a pretty good example, so I'm gonna use it here. Dallas was up big by the third quarter. As you'll remember, they were completely kicking the shit out of Carolina. And Quinn, knowing that Carolina was 3-0 at the time, wanted to slam the door shut on any potential comeback scenario by constantly using Parsons as a pass rush threat. This is a third and three late in the third quarter from the Panthers 32 yard line and Quinn dialed up a pressure here that at least some coaches within the Pete Carroll coaching tree refer to as Bear Blitz 1. At least I know that's what Gus Bradley calls it, I'm not sure what Quinn named it, but hey, we're doing the best we can here with the information we've got, so I'm just going to call it Bear Blitz 1. And in a Bear Blitz 1 call, what that means is that it's a bear front look, or at least what Bradley calls a bear front, some other coaches just call it mug, and the pressure itself is known as Blitz 1, which is just cover 1 on the back end, with man coverage across the board and a single high safety, and a 5 man pressure in front of it. Now, if you go to the end zone angle, the difficulty that this look creates for the offense is how it messes with protection. Typically, with a linebacker as good at rushing the passer as Micah Parsons, you'll often see offenses basically treat them as a fifth defensive lineman, and they'll go into what's known as a 5-0 call and have the center stick on Parsons, while the running back accounts for the dimebacker on the second level, which in this case is a safety as a potential sixth rushing threat from the boundary. Treating Parsons as a fifth defensive lineman honestly isn't a bad idea, because he kind of is. But the hard part about protecting that way is that if you leave your center on Parsons and then Parsons just baits a rush and then drops back into his own, that bait will occupy the center long enough to just cause a whole lot of problems for the guards and tackles that are trying to pass off stunts or three-man twists or anything like that. A big chunk of the center's job in a lot of protection schemes is helping his guards to not get beat on stunts. But he can't do that if he's focused on Parsons in a 5-0 call, even if Parsons isn't actually rushing. So in order to avoid that potential problem where the center blocks nobody while the guards are getting beat by stunts, because Lord knows the Cowboys love to run stunts up front, what the Panthers do here is actually do a half slide to the boundary to get 3 over 2 on that side, since Randy Gregory and Odigizua are the major threats, and then they leave Amir Abdullah inside to account for Parsons if he rushes. And if you've been following everything that I just said very closely, and you understand it, you can probably tell where I'm going with this by now. Parsons knew that he was going to get a good, winnable matchup here on the running back, so the likelihood of getting pressure on Sam Darnold here was very high. Flat out, there's just not a lot of backs in the entire league that can survive against a guy like Parsons. So Darnold has likely about two seconds or even less to get this ball out. More importantly though, in the grand scheme of things, if you look at Trayvon Diggs, he also knew that pretty much no matter what, Darnold was gonna be pressured here. Diggs knows what he's working with up front. He knows that Parsons and Gregory and Odigizua cannot be blocked for more than two seconds if they're all lined up next to each other so he's not going to play corner as if he needs to survive for a long time. That ball is either coming out quick, or Darnold will be turned into a fine pink paste. That's just the reality here. 
so watch how Diggs plays this hitch route accordingly. He barely takes half a step backwards because he's sitting on a quick throw the entire time, and as soon as he reads DJ Moore start to break down, he jumps it. This was essentially a game-ending interception, which obviously is a great play by Diggs individually, but it was made possible in the first place because of the absolute trust that Diggs has in Micah Parsons to force the offense into quicker throws. Ironically enough, on the very next snap for the Cowboys defense, a few minutes later in the fourth quarter, Quinn did the exact same thing again, just from a different front and personnel grouping, because he really wanted to give Parsons another shot at a sack. It's first and 10 this time, Dallas is in a single high safety look, and once again, Quinn is dialing up a three deep fire zone pressure in order to get Parsons an easy matchup on a running back against a two jet protection scheme from Carolina. And I know what some of you might be thinking if you're familiar with pass protection schemes. Brett, it's jet protection. You can just easily get out of that bad matchup by making a sink call so that the guard will be on Parsons instead of a running back. But let's be honest here, the Panthers kind of have to stay in a traditional jet protection here in order to get the benefit of a four-man slide. They just do. They don't really have an option. They cannot pick up a stunt three on three. They are not good enough for that. So they typically have to account for the threat of a three man game with a slide to make it four over three, or they just lose anyway. That means their only option to block Parsons if he rushes is Amir Abdullah. That's it. And I'll tell you what, if the only card you have left in your hand is a 5'9", 205 pound running back throwing a cut block against a guy who's basically the next stage of human evolution, you've probably already lost. The ability to create that extremely favorable matchup on demand just by using fronts and protection rules against an offense, that to me has been Dan Quinn's greatest strength this year. Not only is Parsons a uniquely gifted football player that can do literally anything at a high level, but Quinn goes out of his way to build his call sheet every single week around that uniquely gifted player. To me, this has got to be one of the most dynamic coordinator and player duos on either side of the ball across the entire league because both of them just complement each other so damn well. I don't think that anyone can deny it at this point, but this is a really, really special situation over in Dallas, and I think it needs to be acknowledged as such. So there you have it. There's kind of a top level view of the Mike Parsons role in this defense or rather roles, plural, I should say, as well as kind of an overview of his strengths and how they use them in this system. To me, considering how versatile he is, how dominant he is in every single role that he's asked to play, and how important he is to Dan Quinn, both as a play caller and play designer on defense, I would say that yes, he should be Defensive Player of the Year, even as a rookie. Now, will he actually win the award? That's anybody's guess. I mean, TJ Watts had a fantastic year. Miles Garrett's been dominant. Nick Bosa's been utterly insane. And of course, you can't count out Aaron Donald, Darius Leonard, AJ Terrell even. He's been arguably the best corner in the league this year. So there's a lot of competition for Defensive Player of the Year. But regardless of how you see it, my point does stand. Micah Parsons has a legitimate argument to win it this year. He is a generationally gifted talent, and I think it's safe to say that the Cowboys defense would be nowhere near as good as they are without him being on the field. Whether that very simple truth is enough for voters to give him the trophy when all is said and done, I guess we'll find out. Thank you all for watching. I uh, hope you had a great holidays with your family, and uh, I'll see you back here maybe next week. Uh, again, I'm hopping on a flight to New Orleans in like 12 hours from now, and I won't be back till Monday. So I don't know. We're winging it. I might be back next week. We'll see. But uh, until next time, cheers. Thank you again to Hawthorne for sponsoring this week's show and helping to make it all possible. Hawthorne is a premium tailored men's grooming brand that is all about matching men to the ideal grooming products for their own body chemistry and lifestyle. All you have to do is take a quick quiz online at Hawthorne's website where they ask you a whole bunch of questions about your type of hair and your type of skin, and of course your preferences for fragrance and even your favorite drink, and they'll come up with personalized lists of products from their catalog that fits your needs. And from there, you can pick which products you want and which ones you don't. 
You can get basically anything you'll ever need from body wash to moisturizer to deodorants, cleansers, and cologne. The colognes in particular are what I really like because they aren't too overbearing. They're some of my favorite colognes that I have in my entire collection, to be honest, because of that very unique balance between smelling good, but also not being the only thing that people smell in the room. Hawthorne also takes all of the risk out of it too because you get free shipping on your order and on any returns, and if you don't like your products, they'll even retail them for you based on your feedback also completely for free. If you guys take that really quick quiz below and you see something in their catalog that you want, you can use my promo code FILMROOM10 to get 10% off your first order. Again, that is promo code FILMROOM10 for a 10% discount on anything at hawthorne.co on your first order. They are great products. I've used them for a long, long time at this point. And thank you again to Hawthorne for sticking with me as a longtime sponsor of this show. I wouldn't be able to do it without you guys. So again, thank you to everybody for watching and I'll See you next week. I have no idea if my cat's on camera right now, by the way. He's been here virtually the entire time. I fed him and he still won't leave me alone. I think he senses that I'm gonna fly to New Orleans tomorrow and he's uh, he's very upset. Oh, are you leaving? He's switching positions. There's a lot of places in the house you can sit right now and you chose on camera. Yeah, I'm talking about you. Yeah, my little douchebag. My little camera whore. That's mean. I know. I love you. All right. Where was I?